Be Wealthy and Smart, episode 200. into a world of wealth and financial freedom without budgets, boredom, or bosses on Be Wealthy and Smart. And now, here's your host, Linda P. Jones. Welcome to Be Wealthy and Smart. I'm Linda P. Jones, America's Wealth Mentor, empowering women and men worldwide to financial freedom. Well, today is our 200th episode, and we're going to take a listener question and talk about ways technology is impacting value investing and ways it's not. But first, have you checked out the Creating Wealth podcast with Jason Hartman? He's got 700 podcasts about real estate investing. If you like this podcast, you'll like that one too. Well, I'm really excited that we made it to podcast 200. Yay! I'd love to have a review from you and hear your thoughts about the show. It's really important to me. It makes my day. It's just something that I really love to read and is so important to helping the show and getting the show seen and heard by people because the more reviews I have, the better the show does in search ranks and things like that. So it's important to us podcasters that we have some good reviews from you. So I'd love to have a review. Well, it is Listener Question Friday, and so I'm sharing a rather complex question from a gentleman named Torben. He says, Hi, Linda. I've listened to your podcast for several months now and find it very useful. Your pragmatic approach to finance is very applicable in real life. I personally apply the value investing approach with inspiration from the growth investment theories. Perhaps you could do a podcast about value investing. From Graham and Buffett, over the modern Graham approach to how value investing will play a role in an investing world where tangible assets are much smaller than intangibles and most products and services can be replaced by technological developments in an instant. These developments challenge the fundamental value approach, which looks for large, stable, and cash-generating businesses. So how are these theories going to survive in a world where these types of companies become more scarce? I hope this could be inspiration for a podcast topic. Best regards, Torben. Well, Torben, you hit the nail on the head and you are an inspiration for a podcast topic. So thank you for your question. I'm actually impressed by your question because it shows me that you've done quite a lot of studying and research. And I like that because an educated investor is the best investor. And I do believe that people can do very well on their own investing, but they have to be educated. Well, first, let's talk about value investing. When you're looking at value investing, you're looking to buy businesses below their value, their intrinsic value. Of course, a business is worth its assets minus its liabilities, plus a multiple of its cash flow. So you're talking about the tangibles, the assets minus the liabilities would be more of the tangible side. In the Graham model and Buffett's model, they talk about intrinsic value, but more likely these days, companies are valued for their cash flow and there is a multiple added or multiplied to their cash flow. So it's not just one times their earnings or necessarily two times, it might be three times their earnings. There are different multiples that you multiply the cash flow by. And it depends on the type of the business, how regular the income stream is, etc. A steady rental income might be more valuable than a biotech that might not have earnings for several years, but could pay off big later on, but could be a high risk. So they're going to be valued differently depending on their cash flow and the type of business that they're in. A PE ratio is the price to earnings ratio. It's just the price of the stock divided by the earnings per share and you get a ratio. Being overly concerned with a PE ratio can be a value trap. Today, many financials have low PE ratios, but I wouldn't necessarily want to own them because they're maybe not that healthy of a company. 
I found many of the best quality stocks have high P.E. ratios, and I've always been okay with that as long as it's not too excessive. There are times when the whole stock market gets excessive P.E. ratios, and that's certainly a time to be cautious. You don't want to be a big buyer when the P.E.s are hitting 50, like in 1999. And even in 2009, P.E. ratios hit about 120, which was insane. Today, P.E. ratios average about 23 to 24, which is a little on the high side historically, but nowhere near where they've been. And a P.E. will average around 18 over the longer term. So anything above that is considered more expensive and anything below that is considered value or cheaper. So 18 is kind of the long-term average P.E. ratio that we look at. So 23 to 24 really isn't that far out of line. I'm not concerned about P.E. ratios being too high right here. But I found placing too much emphasis on P.E. ratios is not the way to buy stocks. For me, earnings are everything, and Investor's Business Daily is good at putting stocks through that can slim filter that picks the best stocks for you. And some in the IBD 50 even have lower P.E. ratios like 14, 16, and 22 if that's important to you. They're not value stocks, they're growth stocks, but that's a matter of philosophy and personal choice and what you're comfortable with. Growth stocks just are growing at a higher rate. Value stocks can be something that's out of favor and a little bit more undervalued. I've not found a lot of investors who can really copy Warren Buffett's success or Benjamin Graham's success, but I have seen a lot of investors who are very successful investors without following Benjamin Graham's success or formulas. Benjamin Graham wrote the book, The Intelligent Investor, and talked about buying stocks with a margin of safety. That meant if you could buy them below the value of what the company was worth, then there was a margin of safety. You had a bit of cushion there that you didn't have to worry about if the, the valuation went down. So you can look at what is a company's fair value, what should it be valued at, and is the stock price trading there or is it trading below what that value is and thereby creating a margin of safety? You can still do that even if companies tend to be not full of brick and mortar type businesses anymore. If a business doesn't have tangible assets, but it has intellectual property, like maybe it develops an app, you're going to base that valuation more on the cash flow. If you're buying a gold mine and there's gold in the ground, then obviously you have to value the gold separately from the cash flow. But it doesn't change value investing. You still want to buy the company at a discount, and you still can have a margin of safety if the valuation is higher than the stock price. If Google is worth X amount because of its advertising revenue, but it's selling at a lower price because the stock market drops, you may still want to buy it on sale. And that's perfectly great. You might have that margin of safety there. The fact that there are more businesses being started with intangibles is probably a long-term trend, but there's still a lot of brick and mortar businesses out there that are getting plenty of venture capital funding that are gonna be around for the future. Companies that provide clothing, food, beverages, restaurants, etc., I would think are always gonna be around. So you don't have to worry about every company becoming some sort of intangible company. There's plenty that are still going to have some physical assets, but that's not really where the value is going to be. The value is going to be in the cash flow and in their profitability. That's where the value of the business is going to be more than their physical assets, typically, unless it's a gold mine, and then it might be quite different. When making a long-term investing decision, you'll want to think about such things. I think that's why Buffett was reluctant to invest in technology in the past, because it was hard to know who was going to be a winner long-term. I remember Nokia phones and Blackberries and how they were the rage before iPhones replaced them. If Apple doesn't keep innovating, another phone may come along and replace the iPhone. So you never know with technology it can grow and change and be replaced very, very quickly if innovation doesn't continue. 
Think about the things that we will still need to be using in 10 to 20 years and keep away from a trend that could be a flash in the pan. Maybe like Pokemon Go? <laughs> I don't think that's going to be around 10 years from now, but we might think about it affectionately, kind of like the pet rock. I think though, you're on the right track with looking at a business in terms of how to value it, looking at the cash flow. I just wouldn't worry that more companies don't have tangible assets. I don't think that's going to be as big of a deal. There's some companies that are gonna have tangible assets, like I said, the food, clothing, restaurant type companies, fine. Those are still gonna be around forever. But there are lots of new tech companies or chip making companies that or software companies that don't have the tangible assets. And that's okay. You still can get a good valuation. You still can buy them at below their market price and get that margin of safety. Want to move ahead and get your money, wealth, and net worth moving in the right direction? Then go to my website and get 11 quick financial tips to boost your wealth at lindapjones.com. That's all for today. Until next time, live the good life and be wealthy and smart. Thank you for listening to Be Wealthy and Smart with Linda P. Jones. Share the wealth and tell your family and friends about the show. Check out our website, blog, and social media for more riches at www.bewealthyandsmart.com.